positioning and good governance from a legal point of view, but it can be assured I'm not going to talk about lots of boring legal stuff. Hopefully just draw your attention to some of the things you need to think about that have a, a very strong legal aspect to it. And the first thing we want to do a look at, this machine go, is to give you an overview of this whole process from a legal point of view. First thing is it is actually really complicated. Um, and that's probably why people shy away from it. It's complicated for two reasons, and that is because it involves families, and it involves businesses, and a business operating in the context of a family. Every family is different. Every family here will have different goals, different values, different needs. I think about my family heritage, which is based in the South Island of a farming family. I'm the youngest of eight um, from a farming family and I had six older brothers and their whole purpose in life and my father's whole purpose in life for them was that they would be farmers and it was a race to see who got 10,000 sheep first. Okay, that, was, that was the focus. I married into a farming family from South Taranaki who has very deep roots here. It's very nice to see John here tonight. Um, a much smaller family in a dairy farming context. We were sheep, beef, beef and crop who have been here for nearly 100 years on the same farm. Very different concept, very different context, two wonderful families, but different. Every family is different. And so, because every family is different, how you deal with this future-proofing and transition is going to be different. Every farming business is different. I suspect when I look out here, you just have a raised hand. How many people here are not dairy farmers?
of the farming parents. And I can see by looking at the group here, there are a lot of farming parents here and there are some <coughs> farming succeeding children here, I'm sure. But you've built up your business and your farm and your family. You want the freedom to enjoy life during and after farming? I would imagine. You want some capital for maybe for new off-farm ventures? When you do move off the farm or aren't quite as busy on the farm, you might like to travel a little bit. You want some certainty that you can um, retire with financial security and comfort. And you've earned it, absolutely. The second key complexity and goal that absolutely has to be achieved is a flexible and a resilient plan that allows succeed a succeeding child or children to come into your farming business and become part of it and eventually to own it and not to have to wait until you drop dead and the whole family has a fight over a will and maybe nobody gets a farm, even though they've worked on it most of their lives. So it's really, really important that it's there um, so that the business and personal relationships of, of succeeding children are, are clearly divided so that the, the, the plan allows them to come into the business without messing up the family relationships. And the third key goal is that there's got to be fairness for non-farming children. Many of you, I'm sure, have children who will work on your farm, but you probably also have children who will never work on your farm. Maybe they don't want to, maybe there's not enough farm for everybody, but for whatever reason, we all have non-farming children. I was a non-farming child in my family. There were six who were farmers and two of us who weren't. But everyone else was involved in farming. There needs to be fairness for them too. That might involve extra education, it might involve helping them buy their first home, it might involve some things that we don't always plan and expect, and such things as children who have, need special care and provision. You know, sometimes children arrive in our families that need very special care. We need to be able to provide for them, and whatever plan we have needs to be able to do that. So, we know that it's complex, the key sort of risks that, that are involved are both personal and business risks. From a personal point of view, the family dynamic, and we've mentioned that when Maurice has too. You know, sibling rivalries. I grew up watching my many older brothers, much older brothers, fall and over the dinner table every night as we argued farming things, and my father would want to do it his way, and they would all be, you know, 18 to 25 and wanted to do it their way, and it was my farm thanks to that. There was a queue, basically. The youngest brother was told, go be a school teacher because you're in the queue, there's five ahead of you. Um, it's, it was very, very real, and I remember that vividly as a child. There's also different cultures that come into a family, and Trevor may allude to this, and I know he has when he's spoken, um, I've heard him speak before. You know, your, your succeeding son or daughter marries, and they bring in their partner. And their partner comes from a different farming family with a different culture, or they might not come from a farming family at all. And that can be hard as two families blend and try and work together to run a business and still be a family. And so good planning allows flexibility to make those sorts of things work. And I know Trevor has talked about how they've done that on another occasion in his family, so I'm hoping he might um, deliberate today as well. Another thing that can happen and really cause great harm and or great grief is a premature death. It might be the premature death of the um, parent, who has just left a will and nothing else, or it might be the premature death of a succeeding child or their spouse, which makes it really hard to carry on the farm if you haven't got a structure in place that allows the business to continue. Then of course there's the risk of relationship breakups, and we know the statistics in New Zealand aren't very good, and the family court is a way of you know, grabbing farm's money. There's another personal aspect too that I think is very real for many farmers, and that is an attachment to a particular piece of land that may have been in your family for many generations, and you want to be able to keep that particular piece of land in the family for, for all sorts of reasons. When it comes to your business, profitability. Your business has got to be profitable enough that it will support more than one farming family if you're going to transition to the next generation and, and provide for everybody. Your business has got to have an ability to cope with change. That might be external economic factors, might be on-farm changes, and Therese might add a little more in there. Well, there's a, a, a plenty of examples of those kind of decisions that one person, when you're in a large family business, shouldn't make on their own. And probably a recent example of that would be the sheer surrender option that you had with Frontera. So that was quite a big deal. It had a, 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 
an opportunity to cash out some money and I uh, know it was very popular because it was oversubscribed but I wonder how many people actually sat around and discussed that decision in, in their family business with everybody to make sure that they felt comfortable because there would have been varying views about what to do with that money and whether it was the right thing to do. Um, who you employ as your advisors might be another example. Do you want to change banks? Do you want to change which company you supply? Um, all of those things are actually quite big strategic decisions and when you're in a family business, uh, that, that decision will impact on everybody that's involved. So those are the kind of things that, um, you know, when you're in a, a family business with a semi-formal corporate governance kind of approach, those are the kind of decisions that would be discussed and agreed between uh, the advisors and the board. Now, the next key thing is the plan and the way it works. So if we look at all the scary things, what has to happen and, and why it does all the risks, how do you make a way through? And the very first thing is that the farming parents who have worked so hard for so long on that business need to sit down together and think about what they want. What's, what do you want? What do you need in the future? And your wants and needs will certainly centre on yourselves, but they may centre on other things too, like the wider family and what you want to be able to do for them and those sorts of things. But you need to sit down and talk about it together. You then need to communicate both very well together, but also to your family. And so that it's not the elephant in the room that we all hide behind and don't want to talk about. Um, and because sometimes people drop dead before they get around to talking about it. And then a whole family is, and I'm sure you've all seen examples of family havoc when people have a and someone drops dead. The next step is to get a team of competent business advisors. The sort of people you need in that team are your accountant, your lawyer, your banker, your insurance broker. Maybe your farm advisor. But you need the people who are going to help you put the financial and legal structure together that's going to make it work. So when you've got that team of advisors, and that team of advisors sometimes is a different team from the team you've had through the years, depending on you know what your needs are and whether you need a fresh approach, think about it. You then need to create a flexible and integrated legal structure that the whole family and their advisors understand. It's not about getting some old ancient document out that sets up a trust and says, yeah, put everything in your trust and that'll be right. It's a whole, there's a whole lot more to it than that. And it needs to be understandable and communicated well to everybody. And there's all sorts of different vehicles that can be involved in that. Trusts are certainly a very important part of that. And you probably, if you've talked to your boys about trust, they'll talk about statements of wishes that help your trustees out and move on to know what you want them to do with your trust. Companies are a very important part of that, and the trust and company structure is a very common and flexible structure that many people use. If you've got a company, you need a constitution and you need a shareholders agreement that deals with the private things that you agree amongst your family for, for being how things will work. A shareholders agreement that allows people to actually leave the business if they want to. If your succeeding son or daughter comes onto the farm and 15 years later says, oh, actually mum and dad, I don't think I want to be a farmer anymore, I want to do something else. How do you deal with that? That's the sort of thing that needs to be agreed and documented sensibly. Limited partnerships are another option. I think Kenneth and Rachel might talk about that. Um, and extraordinary partnerships. You need to update your will. People have wills and they've got a will, I'm fine. I haven't updated it for 30 years. It's probably not much use and actually it's also great trouble. You need to have enduring powers of attorney. If suddenly you become ill and can't function, you have a stroke, you pull off the track, you bang your head, whatever. Those sorts of things need to be in place. Once you've got that structure, you then move on to the good governance that Maurice has been talking about and use that structure with good governance um, practices and decision making. You need also to include in that some good and appropriate insurance. What if your succeeding son or daughter has a serious accident and can't farm anymore? Who's going to actually do the day-to-day? -day? Who's going to pay for someone to do the day-to-day? All those sorts of things need to be dealt with. And you need to, as Maurice has already said, regularly review your plan. Because the plan is going to be a flexible plan that can change and is very likely going to need to change. So regularly sitting down with the team advisors to say, well, does it still work? Do we need to tweak it? What do we need to do? So there is a process. So it is complicated um, and it is really important, but there is a way through it. And that way through is about planning and communication and good advice and flexible 
integrated structures that actually move. There aren't just bits of paper in the back door that we set up once upon a time and then we forgot about and hope that they 